Good morning, everyone. I am Jonathan Little. Today, um, we may be having internet issues. So, this may be a very short, a little coffee, or there may be no issues. You never really know. Life is like a box of chocolates, as they do say. We have our morning coffee. We need it today. Today's going to be a full day of writing. I'm currently in the middle of a big writing project. It's a secret, so I can't talk about it. It's not due for another year and a half, so I have all the time in the world. But if you all know me, I'm the exact opposite of a procrastinator. I get everything done way, 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 way ahead of time. So we're doing that. As soon as I finish this one, I think it'll take me a week or so. Um, I'm going to start working on excelling at online No Limit Hold'em. You all know excelling at No Limit Hold'em. Uh, where is it? Here it is. It's a great book. Perhaps the best-selling poker book on the market right now, so thank you all for that. Um, we worked with a lot of good people here, and you all liked this format. So, I'm going to be making an online version with some of the best online players in the world. We already have uh, quite a few of them lined up. A lot of them are part of the Pokar Backing Company, an incredibly profitable uh, backing company I'm part of. And um, we're going to be telling you all about how to beat online poker. But, uh, you know, poker titles on books are a little bit um, deceptive because at the end of the day, it's going to teach you how to play really, really good poker and how to exploit tough players. It's going to be a good book. I'm very excited about it. It's good for me because uh, I, get to, I get to learn a lot from the best players in the world. So what more do I want, right? Did I get Duan on that project? Duan is not a part of the Pokar backing company. So no. All right. We had a question sent in about tournament structures. What do we look for in a tournament structure? Well, first things first, I don't really care that much. A lot of people really care about tournament structures because they think it significantly matters. Um, let's just go through. A little bit of a little bit of text I wrote for you today. So first things first, what are the common tournament structures, right? Well, the the oldest one, the normal one, was a freeze out, freeze out, which is just a regular tournament. You show up, you play, you bust, you lose, you go home. Um, you cannot re-enter. You you're when you're done, when you're out of chips, you're done. I like this format a lot. This is my favorite. I am super excited that. Poker or party poker is going back to that format for all their tournaments um, because it is very, very skill intensive and also it keeps a lot of very, very good players out of the field multiple times. And you may say, well, how can you play multiple times? That's what's uh, been making poker tournaments not nearly as profitable for a long time now. The re entry tournaments. You may say, I like re entry tournaments because if I bust, I get to play again. Sure, I get it. And interestingly enough, all of these tournament structures, or a lot of these tournament structures that have been created are often quite good for the good players and quite bad for the bad players. And bad players don't realize that. Um, take a look at the average field at the end of a freeze-out, right? Or the average field in a freeze-out. Let's say there are 1,000 people. There may be 300 good players, 700 bad players. Okay? Now let's look at a re-entry tournament, which is what the vast majority of tournaments are today. If you look at that field, it may be twice as big, 2,000 people, but it will instead be 1,000 good players and 1,000 bad players. So instead of being 300 good players, 700 bad players, it's now 1,000 good players and 1,000 bad players. And that's because the good players are willing to re-enter as much as they can, as much as they need to, because they know every time they buy in, they're going to have a positive expectation, right? And they should re-enter a lot. Recreational players should not re-enter, to be fair. If they care about money, recreational players should not play, which a lot of people, they, t they, they get up in arms about that. Don't tell me what to do with my money. I'm just trying to give you advice to help you not lose your money, right? If you are a losing player, you should not be playing. You should be playing in softer games. If you're going to play, though, and you want to play a tournament, it should not be the re-entry tournaments because re-entry tournaments highly favor the pros. Man, I can't talk today. I have a little coffee. Everyone asks in the morning, where's Mr. James? Mr. James has breakfast exactly at 9 a.m. every day. He's on a great schedule, and we don't mess that up for anything. Um, so what, is, what have re-entry tournaments done? Well, they've made the return on investment of bad players go down, and they made the return on investment for good players go down. 
And if you go back to that initial field size we talked about earlier, 300 good players versus 700 bad players, good players are going to have a nice return on investment. If it's 1,000 and 1,000 instead, good players are going to have way less return on investment because there's more bad players' money to chop up, right? Um, that's essentially what happens in tournaments. Uh, that's how you can figure out a rough ROI. Is you can figure out the average losing ROI of a bad player. Obviously, there are various degrees. And then you divide that by the, ROI, by the uh, good players left. So let's say you're playing a sit-and-go, a 10-handed tournament. And there are two bad players who you think have minus 50% ROI each, which is pretty hard to do. But let's pretend like they have that. In that scenario, if all the other good players are equally good, which will not be true, but if they are all equally good, they will be chopping up two, one whole starting stack, right? Minus 50% ROI times two is one starting stack. Minus the rake, which may be one whole starting stack. In that scenario, everyone breaks even. If there was no rake, eight players would chop up one starting stack, which would give them, uh, what, 12.5% ROI. Okay? That's how you can easily figure out return on investments. And like I said, all bad players are not equally bad. All good players are not equally good. There may be one really good player who gets like half of that whole return on investment. Or um, maybe one of the bad players is only like minus 10% ROI, which is often what happens at sit and goes. They'll be everyone very, very close to even, and at the end of the day, no one really wins. They all essentially just lose the rake. Um, so in big tournaments, same thing, right? Say it's a re-entry tournament. Um, if there are 1,000 good players and 1,000 bad players, as opposed to 300 good players and 700 bad players, the good players are chopping up fewer stacks. So, re-entry tournaments bring down the average ROI of everyone. Also, interestingly enough, um, the average ROI goes down, and also, very often, the buy-in goes down. If you look at a lot of the higher-stakes series, um, they've gone from $10,000 main events to 5000 to 3500 to 1500 It's like, when are we going to end, right? They keep getting smaller and smaller. That said, um, World Poker Tour still has a lot of 10Ks, a lot of, you know, they have, they've had a 15K, I don't know if they do anymore. But they still have a lot of um, big tournaments, which is good. That, that, those are actually worth it for the pro to travel to. So I definitely like that a lot. Um, let's see. How do you go deep in tournaments? Go to PokerCoaching.com. You always get eliminated by the bubble. Well, you're probably playing way too tightly or way too aggressively. One of the two. Are you late? We start at 9 a.m. sharp every day. What's a good player's ROI? It depends on the field and the field size, right? Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll to study about this. Should generally continuation that versus value against the calling station? Maybe. Depends on how they play on the turn in the river. Um, let's see. Any history of playing a winter classic in Atlantic City? I don't know the names of various tournaments. I'm quite bad at that. I know they have a tournament in January. I've played it most years. I didn't play it this year. I'm not going to play it this year because I have a baby. It's irresponsible in my mind to travel when you have a month-old baby. Doesn't seem ideal. All right. Real world, po real world poker city. Final table at WPT last week. Good job. Rory says, the tips are amazing. I'm glad to hear that. Would you call it 100,000 chip pot? First off, Andrew, this is an awful question. Awful, awful question. We don't know stack sizes. We don't know how long you're in the reentry period. We don't know who you're against. Would I call with a straight and a flush draw? Uh, maybe. Depends on the pot size, right? Awful, awful, awful question. How is rate calculated in cash games? It depends on the place. Usually they just count the pot and take their percentage. Okay, back to the question. This is not ask me anything. I'm not lazy. Um, <laughs> maybe you all don't, know, don't understand my view on ask me anything. I think ask me anything are for people who roll out of bed, think, uh, I don't really want to create any good content. I just want to blabber on about whatever people want to hear. To be fair, that, that's more than you get from most people. So I guess if you're, people are doing nothing or an ask me anything, it's nice and easy. But um, ask me anything are... Not what we do here very often. And they are good every once in a while. I, I, per, I definitely do think that. But I'm trying to provide you good, actionable advice in a consistent format that allows you to learn a lot about poker. Not just, what do I do with this hand? What do we do with this hand? Go to um, the Inner Circle, pokercoaching.com slash Inner Circle. I'll spend 15 minutes with you personally. Every two weeks, we will answer your questions and we will um, get you the right answers. But anyway, uh, we're not just going to jump all over topics until we're done with the main presentation. All right. 
Next, re-entry, uh, rebuy tournaments. Rebuy tournaments uh, pretty much went away. Um, and that's because, well, I think the real reason is because they often did not rake um, the, re the rebuys and the, the add-ons. Now they do. I actually played a tournament recently in Vegas that was a $200 rebuy tournament. And they, um, they raked the, re the rebuys, which is pretty brutal. Um, so I guess that doesn't make a difference. But also it keeps the game, it keeps the integrity of the game up because you have to go to the cage to buy in as opposed to hand cash to a guy and the guy gives you chips. That can get a little bit shady. And especially, uh, you don't want to open any doors for easy shadiness, right? So, um, very often in rebuy tournaments, you get some sort of a discount on your rebuy and or add-on. Right? So let's say you buy in for $100 and you get 5,000 chips. If you add, last until the add-on period is over, you are able to uh, make an add-on for $100 again that gets you, let's say, 10,000 chips. So if initially for $100, you get 5,000. Later, you get 10,000. Obviously, you need to get to that stage, right? So for that reason, you're pretty much roped into never busting before that. Um, the tournament I played in Vegas, it was a $200 buy-in, and the add-on did give you extra as well. And multiple people played just one time and then left. And that is so, 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 so bad. You have to view tournaments like that as a tournament that you are definitely playing for at least a buy-in and an add-on. Very often you should re-buy right at the beginning if they let you do that as well, um, if the opponents are bad. You never want to have a lot of chips if you are bad. If you're good, though, you often want a lot of chips. You also want a lot of chips if the players on your right have a lot of chips, and if the players on your left have a lot of chips, you don't want a lot of chips. Because chips flow to the left in games with position. Where can you get coaching from me? Go to poker or pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. Everyone thinks this is an ask me anything. Why does everyone think this is an ask me anything? I so don't understand. The title is not Ask Me Anything today. The title is Tournament Structures. Okay, next. Um, Re-entry tournaments, yeah. Or, sorry, rebuy tournaments. View them as if you play a $100 rebuy tournament with the add-on, et cetera, et cetera, you are playing a $300, maybe $500 tournament, and you need to realize that. This is not a $100 tournament. Um, so a $100 bankroll is not going to cut it. Gregory Bow almost almost got the URL right. You spell my name J O N H. Or actually, you got it completely wrong. It's pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. Let's see. You're enjoying the course. You bought it for your wife. Awesome. I'm glad glad you're enjoying it. Hope it's beneficial. All right. Next, we have bounty tournaments. Recreational players love bounty tournaments because you get to bust a guy, and when, whenever you've busted someone in a bounty tournament, you get money. Now, first things first, how much is a bounty worth in terms of chips? One second, I'm just reading something about range tournaments. Don't rebuys go into the prize pool? Of course they do. Should you always add on? Only The only time you don't want to add on is if you have like a boatload of chips, like your chip leader by a mile. Um, rebuys turn into crapshoots. It depends on how long you can re-enter for, right? All right. Bounty tournaments. You need to figure out what a bounty is worth in terms of chips. So as an easy example, let's say it's a $100 tournament with a $100 bounty. So it's a $200 buy-in tournament. Half goes to the bounty, half goes to the prize pool, okay? Let's say for that, they give you 10,000 starting chips and a bounty chip, okay? What you do is you take the stacks and you put them into equal piles because there are two... $200 go in, one half of it is uh, the bounty money, the other half is the tournament chips. So if you get 10,000 chips, a bounty, when you collect it, can collect it, is also worth 10,000 chips. So now let's make it um, a little bit more complicated. Let's say it's a $100 bounty, $100 tournament with a $10 bounty. So let's say it's 100 plus 10, so it's a $110 tournament plus whatever the rake is. Um, now you make 10 piles but 10 piles plus the bounty chip because you have 10 to 1, right? 10 to 1 buy-in to bounty ratio. So let's say they give you 10,000 chips now. 
a bounty is worth uh, one eleventh of that because you have 11 piles, right? You have 10,000 chip piles, and then you have the one bounty chip. So now it's um, one eleventh of 10,000, which is, I don't know, 9,100 or, or 9, 911. So in that spot, that's how much a bounty is worth. Very important you realize this. Very important you understand how, um, how much the bounty chip is worth because sometimes it's worth a lot, sometimes it's worth not a lot. All right, um, so they are also tournaments called progressive knockout tournaments, especially online. Um, you have to figure out how much bounties are worth there. It's often kind of complicated to do on the fly, but uh, my friend Rob Tinian has a site, Max Value, max-value.com, and they have a bounty calculator there for, well, all bounty tournaments, but for progressive tournaments, it's actually really, really useful. So bounty tournaments are particularly awful for good players, because the um, the payouts are distributed among everyone else, right? When the payouts are distributed among everyone else, in a game where pros actually want it to be winner take all, because the pros are going to win more than everybody else, then that's good for the recreational players, bad for the pros. But you see a lot of pros still playing these games. You may ask why. And the reason for that is because very often the recreational players make pretty big blunders when it comes to dealing with, um, let's see, one second. When it comes to dealing with um, the, the bounties, right? They don't know how much they're worth. So they make horrible, horrible decisions when it comes to that. So keep that in mind. Good, 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 good. All right. Always understand what the tournament structure you are playing dictates, right? And if there's a situation where you get, let's say, 10,000 chips and your starting stack is 10,000, in that scenario, collecting the bounty is very relevant. If you get 900 chips, it doesn't actually matter that much, right? Um, also, as you get later in the tournament in a regular bounty event, the bounty does not matter much at all. And again, a lot of recreational players are really trying to collect that bounty, which is a big problem. Let's see, next, um, satellite tournaments. Satellite tournaments are particularly terrible for good players, and that's because now, whenever you win, you don't get to win very often, right? I mean, whenever you win, you don't actually get much money. You get very, very little, very few, very, very few buy-ins when you win. And also, oh, there we go. Um, Sorry, I'm being, being distracted by, by nonsense. Um, yeah, satellites, the way they work is instead of there being a winner, right, who gets a lot of buy-ins, everyone gets 10 buy-ins or 5 buy-ins, something like that. And when there are, when, when that is the maximum return on investment you can get, inevitably, you're not going to have that high of a potential return on investment. So satellites are quite good for players who are not good, and they're quite good for players, who, or quite bad for players who are good, quite good for players who are not so good, assuming they know how to adjust their strategy appropriately. Um, the big problem with satellites in general is that a lot of players who are good at satellites think they're good at poker, or think they're good at tournaments in general, and they're completely different structures, right? In a regular tournament, you're trying to win the tournament. In a um, satellite, you're, you're not trying to win the tournament. You're actively trying to not win the tournament. There's a chapter in... Um, excelling at No Limit Hold'em by Bernard Lee on satellites. Definitely check that out if you want to play them. There are also things called survivor tournaments that are exactly the same thing. Um, are these similar to Double or Nothing Sit and Goes? Um, yeah. Except for in Double or Nothing Sit and Goes, you only have to get through half of the field, so it's even more. Um, your, your return on investment is going to be even lower in those. Also, you're going to find that whenever the structure gets easier to play, meaning just get in the top half of the field or just get in the top 10% of the field, that's the optimal strategy for that game is often quite easy. And if the optimal strategy is quite easy to learn, then ROI should also be low, right? Because it's not hard to figure out the right play. So that's always a bit of an issue. Now let's talk about what do pros want. Now, this is going to assume time does not matter, okay? If time does matter, then pros are going to want something different. 
But assuming you are going to a place to play a poker tournament, you don't really care how long it takes. Pros want slow structures that allow for lots of hands to be played. Someone, I think the person who asked this question said, how long do the blind levels need to be? And that actually is not so relevant, right? Let's say they give you a million chips. Um, say they give you a million chips and the blinds start at 510 and they go up every five minutes, but they go 510, 1020, 1025, 2550, you know, it goes up rather slowly. Well, that's great, right? You can even, then the blind levels go up every five minutes, right? If the blinds go up every five minutes, it doesn't matter if they give you infinite chips. Um, let's say they don't give you very many chips. Say they start with 100 big blinds, but the blind levels go up every four hours. Well, then, um, it's like it's the same thing, right? It's a super slow structure. So in those scenarios, that's going to be quite good for the pros because they have a lot of time to extract value. Sort of like whenever you're playing a cash game where the blinds don't go up. If you're a good cash game player, your um, graph, your, your profit, is going to go pretty much consistently up over the long term. Let's see. Ideally, pros want very top-heavy structures, which is also something that has killed ROIs across the board. If you look at a lot of tournaments now, they have flattened the payout structure significantly. Back in the day, um, they paid out like 8% or 10% of the field. Actually, before I started playing poker, they paid the final table. That was it. Um, so imagine you're playing a 500-person tournament and they only pay the final table. Well, uh, that's incredibly top-heavy, right? And that's really good for the pros. And this is how a lot of the best, uh, the big names were created before the moneymaker boom, because these players actually won like all of the money because they'd be playing a 500 person tournament and only top nine would get paid. And you know, if, if you're getting humongous paydays whenever you win, it, it drastically change, changes the structure. But ideally pros want winner take all tournaments, which you don't see, but that is what a pro would like because they are gonna take first place way more often than everyone else. They do not want a very flat payout. Flat payouts are great for recreational players because they get to cash more often, right? When you cash, you feel like you've won, and if you feel like you've won, then, um, well, that's good. All right, what next? What's next? Um, essentially, bounties are bad for pros, satellites are bad for pros, turbos are bad for pros, etc., etc., etc. All of these are bad for pros. Um, some people are saying that some satellite players can be good at poker. Of course they can. Some bounty players can be good at poker. Some uh, turbo players can be good at poker. Don't get me wrong. Um, in general, though, the structures that are the most skill intensive are the ones that are very, very slow. Certainly, you can be good at all sorts of various structures, right? I'm very good at nine-handed sit and goes. Nine-handed sit and goes have a low ROI. They are actually not that hard to get that good at, right? But it's doable. Certainly, you can become a good player at various games. And I, I do view all these as different games. I view satellites as a different game than No Limit Hold'em tournaments. And you should, right? Because they are different. I mean, certainly you can be a good PLO player and a good No Limit Hold'em player. It's, it's like obvious, right? Let's see. Some people are mentioning this guy, Dary. <laughs> Dara. This guy, Dara, has a podcast apparently where they were um, talking crap about me. I did not appreciate that. And um, I've since disassociated myself from anything related to them because they were very, very, very trolly. Because I made the statement, satellite players are typically worse than, no, than uh, regular tournament players. And it's true. Look across the board, right? But people get offended because they cannot read. They do not listen to full comments. They do not read full, um, not even full tweets. And the gist of that was, is that most satellite players, not good professional satellite players, most good satellite players... Um, I'm sorry, most, most satellite players are quite bad because first off, they're trying to satellite in because they can't afford the actual tournament, right? Um, obviously, they're very good satellite players. Like I know um, Stephen Chidwick used to be a regular on the high stakes satellites, but he wasn't playing to try to get into a tournament to play a game 10 times the buy-in to hope to get lucky. He was playing because he was realized all those people who play those games are fish. <laughs> it's not so hard to beat those games. And then, you know, he's playing it for cash, right? I play satellites quite frequently for cash. Um, it was funny, actually. Whenever I took uh, sixth place at the Aria WPT last year, I satellited in because uh, there was nothing else going on that day, and I played satellites perfectly fine. Like we said, it's not a hard structure. And um, 
I'm a satellite player now because I got in for a thousand bucks. I look like some huge success story, right? But in reality, I was playing it for cash because I was playing the tournament anyway. Do I need you to handle my light, my your lighting? I have one big light above my head. We're not a fancy planet, fancy pants YouTube uh, person yet. We'll get there one day. We're in a little closet for those who don't know. It's a nice little closet, but it is a little closet. I definitely could use some lighting work, but it already gets hot in here as is. The blinds go up so fast they turn into shove fests. Again, blinds going up fast does not matter. What matters is. Uh, how, how long does the tournament actually last, right? Online, blinds go up every three minutes or five minutes, yet the tournaments can last for three days. And how does that happen? Well, the blinds go up very, very slowly, so keep that in mind. Um, one big takeaway, about, takeaway from this is that re-entry tournaments are quite bad for, well, everyone in general. And... Um, I think a lot of people are realizing that. Like, I know Party Pokers realize that, and they said that their next series, they are going to... Um, they are going to re-entry tournaments. Or, sorry, uh, freeze-out tournaments, which I think is great. Tournaments like the LAPC have always been great because um, it's been a re-entry... Or, been a, been a freeze-out tournament. I think that's definitely a good thing. Oh, oh the light work. You mean uh, dealing with people who are disrespecting me. <laughs> Listen, people are allowed to disrespect other people. They also have to realize, though, that um, sometimes people bite back. I mean, I've disassociated myself with everything relating to that person we mentioned earlier because I am not going to be involved with people who are mindless haters. If people are mindless haters, get out of here. I want nothing to do with you. If you are a toxic personality, like that person earlier, I want nothing to do with you, and that's okay. And it's also important to realize there are many, many audiences out there. There are audiences out there who love drama, who love hatred, who love toxicity. They get off on that. And that's just not what we're going to do here, right? We are nice, positive people who are trying to actually benefit the poker community instead of drag people through the mud. Um, let's see. You never, or you get that, but you've never seen a satellite that essentially isn't a semi-turbo. Sure. Actually, the ones online are very slow. Um, if you look at any $500 buy-in satellite online, they're, they're quite, quite slow structures. World Series announced this year. The stack sizes are bigger, but no structure. <laughs> no structure there. Yeah, it's funny. Your casino does rebuys for a very long time. Yeah, rebuy tournaments are interesting, right? Um, when determining when, or re-entry tournaments are interesting, because if you, if you ask yourself, how many big blinds do you get whenever you enter or re-enter at the last minute? In some places, like I know Bellagio does this, it's something like 15 big blinds, or sometimes eight big blinds. Eight big blinds is not a lot, and you're not going to have much of an edge at all if you buy in with that stack size. I've talked with a lot of the best pros, best players in the world, best pros, best players slash best pros, and they essentially said that with something like 15 big blinds or shorter, you probably shouldn't be re-entering if everyone's good. With um, more than that, it's just always fine, assuming the field is not very, very tough. Obviously, as the field is softer and softer, you can re-enter with a shorter stack if you expect to have an edge. It is important to realize, though, that your ROI on that very shallow stack will be very, very, very low, right? And that's because you're starting off with 15 big blinds. You just can't have a big return on investment with a 15 big blind stack. Uncle Eddie in the house. Good morning, Uncle Eddie. Thomas said you're a satellite player. You have 500% ROI in satellites. Um, that may be a little bit optimistic. And 12% in tournaments. Example proven. I mean, listen. It's important to realize that any individual example does not prove anything, but um, you can definitely make broad generalizations. It's like saying pot limit Omaha players are worse at no limit hold'em tournaments than no limit hold'em players. It's probably just true, especially limit hold'em players, right? Limit hold'em players are worse at no limit hold'em tournaments than no limit hold'em players. It's like, duh. No Limit Hold'em tournament players are going to be better than almost any other game player at exactly No Limit Hold'em tournaments. This is common sense. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. It just takes listening and being uh, realistic. Let's see. Lots of people at your game wait to the last minute to buy in. Um, some people do that. Some pros will do that, actually. And those pros are often very, very good with shallow stacks, but very, very bad with deep stacks. And they are not egotistical to the point that they 
are they they overestimate their skills, right? A lot of players assume that they must be good at all buy and are all sack depths, and that's just not true. Especially the online players, because especially back in the day, online poker started with seventy five big blinds and then just got shallow very quick. So a lot of players are very very good at um, short stacks, and they realize that. So they buy in late and they shoot their fifteen big blind stack in there perfectly might I add, and they get whatever small ROI they can get out of it. Let's see. The World Series is promising more chips, but don't they have to speed up the structure to compensate for that? It depends, right? It depends on, um, it depends exactly on what their mindset and their attitude is when approaching the game, right? If they're gonna make every tournament last four days, which, you know, they used to, all tournaments at the World Series used to be two day events, then they became three-day events, and sometimes they're four-day events now. If they're fine with all tournaments being four-day events, maybe five-day events, then why not? Also, adding more chips really doesn't make that big of a difference. It, it does make some bit of a difference, but not a ton. You started taking notes in your live game, and you feel yourself improving already. Excellent. I'm glad to hear it. That's what you need to do, actually. Um, it's how you get good. You figure out what you're doing wrong, and you adjust to take advantage of other people's mistakes and fix their own flaws. James, James, come here. We're gonna see if Mr. James is available. I see him running with a football. You wanna come say hi to daddy? One second, Mr. James will be arriving shortly. He doesn't know anything about tournament structures yet. Really, though, structure doesn't matter that much. That's the gist of it. Oh, who do you see? Can you say hello to everyone? No. Can you wave? Uh, Where are you going? Uh, what are you doing? Uh, oh, did you hit your mouth? Can you stand up? Uh, stand up. Stand up. Uh, Football. Uh, uh, what? Can you say hello? No. All right, fine. Go. Bye. Love you. No. Oh, you want to stay in here with me? No, you got to go. Go. Go, go, go. No, no, no. Will you be sitting and be good? No. That's a robot, yeah, that's a robot. Boss. Oh, Mr. James. Boss. All right, Grandpa. Uncle Eddie's here today. Say hi to Eddie, Grandpa. You want Everybody want to see Grandpa? Come in, Grandpa. Eddie. Come in. Come in. Here's Grandpa. He watches Mr. Bye. James. Hi, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, you're going? Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. We're going to say bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. No, no, no. Did you say bye-bye? <laughs> This is what being a papa's all about. Bye, I love you. Oh, what a treat, huh? <laughs> all right, let's see. He looks like me. Yes, he does. I posted a story on Instagram yesterday of um, me going to the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art with Mr. James. It was a lot of fun. It was a nice time. You can find that on my Instagram story. It'll probably expire um, in about two or three hours. So check it out. Came in ninth in a small tournament. Nice job. My tournament cheat sheet helped. Great. Glad to hear it. How's living with kids in New York? Perfectly fine. Let's see. Your daughter was giving you hell this morning for getting ready for school. Yeah, uh, that's how it works sometimes. Mr. James is too cute. Yes, he is a cute man. Uh, he's developing a bit of a personality. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. <laughs> All right, seems like everyone wanted to ask me anything earlier. I remember one question, how do you beat the micro stakes? You play better than your opponents. The easy answer to all poker questions. You play in games that you can beat and you play a lot in games that you can beat. Everyone seems to want to play a short period of time and get rich quick. And poker is so not a get rich quick game. It looks like a get rich quick game, which is why it's very profitable. But if you look at pretty much all the big winners in poker, they've all been around many, many years. They've all played a ton, they've all studied a ton, they've all devoted their lives to it. Every day it seems like I get an email saying, I'm in a bad spot in life, I have no money, can you teach me poker so I can win some money? And the answer to that is like obviously no. If you don't know how to play poker, why would you possibly think you can just get into it and get good at it immediately? And also, like I said, it takes years. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. Just because someone wins every tournament does not mean that uh, it's going to be you, and it also doesn't mean that that's how much they win in a day or anything like that. 
Um, there's a lot of sensationalizing of poker where people say, oh, look at what a, what a great, a great uh, amount to win in a week or something like that. Whenever someone wins a major tournament, he won five million in just three days. Yeah, not really, <laughs> right? Let's see. There needs to be a link at the end of each quiz to the next quiz. Uh, yeah, we're actually working on a lot of upgrades to PokerCoaching.com, and that is one of them. We're also making the quizzes searchable. We're going to make them filterable. We're going to do lots and lots of things coming up in the very near future. We just have to figure out all the things we want to do because there are um, quite a lot. <laughs> the biggest losers are the people who min cash the most. That is accurate. Daniel Negreanu did a, it's not really a study, a semi-study on World Poker Tour players who had played more than 50 tournaments, which, you know, isn't really a lot. But in that sample size, the biggest losing players who played consistently all had the biggest cash rate. And uh, that's quite telling, right? Getting in the money is quite bad. And this is one of the reasons that satellite players are particularly bad in regular tournaments, because they're really, really, really good at cashing. They're great at cashing. But cashing makes you a loser. <laughs> cashing somehow makes you a loser in no limit holding tournaments. Who'd have thought? Celebrity Poker Showdown, long time ago, got you into poker because you saw rich stars throwing their money away. <laughs> the early season of the World Poker Tour got me into poker because uh, I was already decent at sit-and-goes and saw them playing a sit-and-go, and I thought, oh my goodness, I need to get in these sit-and-goes. Is it possible to be better at 2-5 than 1-2, or are they the same? They're essentially the same. You feel like the lower stakes become more bingo. Everyone who says anything like this tech... You do not understand why you make money from poker. You make money from poker because your opponents make mistakes. If your opponents play well, you're not going to make a mistake. Or they're not making mistakes, which means you don't make any money. You need to play against players who are bad. You should always, across the board, have a higher win rate against people who make bigger mistakes compared to people who make smaller mistakes or no mistakes. If you want to play against poker that actually is bingo... Go play the super high roller tournaments, because in those tournaments, everyone is very, very good. If everyone's very, very good, there is no edge. Or if there is an edge, it's a minimal edge. If everyone's very, very bad, your edge is going to be gigantic. And you may say, well, everyone sees the flop with every hand. Everyone besides you, right, you get to determine which hands you play. So let's say you play the top 10% of hands, and your opponents all play 100% of hands. You are going to crush them. You're not going to win every pot. Right? There's going to be a lot of variance because you may win only 7 out of 10 hands instead of you know, 9 out of 10 hands like everyone else. But 7 out of 10, I'm sorry, you may lose 7 out of 10, so you're going to win 3 out of 10, give or take. And that's okay. Also, if you're good and you don't stack off whenever your opponents obviously have you beat, you're going to be crushing them, right? So um, be aware of that. Most players who complain about small stakes players tend to stack off with one pair. Yeah, that's exactly true. They'll have their aces. They'll get seven-way action. The flop will come, nine, eight, six. They'll bet. Somebody will raise. They'll go all in. The next thing you know, they're broke. And um, <laughs> you're going to lose if you do that. That's for sure. But no, if people make mistakes, you make money. If people play well, you don't make money. Let's see. It takes at least a year or two to um, find and notice leaks in your own game. Yeah, I mean, you can speed that up by getting a coach. You can speed that up by studying a lot, but you're absolutely right. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to lose. I mean, for example, when I first started playing poker, I was pretty much a winner right off the bat, and that's because I studied a ton before I ever played the game. I studied a lot because I don't actually like the act of playing the game. I like the act of learning the game, and this is for all games across the board. Like when I used to play chess, I would read a ton about chess and play not a lot. But when I played, I was pretty good. Um, Magic the Gathering, same thing. Like today, I don't even play. I haven't played a game of Magic the Gathering in like a year. Yet I still watch lots of content and read lots of strategy articles because I like the learning process of the game. The actual going through the motions is not that interesting to me. Like that's the, most, that's the least interesting part of games to me. Um, I'm working on a book with Michael Acevedo, Modern Poker Theory. It's almost finished and... He didn't play much poker for the last two years, yet he studied the game extensively. He likes learning the game. He just now started playing again, and he's winning every tournament he plays. It's pretty insane. Because he studied a ton, right? Let's see.
Do I prefer a tight small ball strategy or super aggressive strategy in big tournaments like the main event? Um, depends on your strategy overall, right? I definitely would not say De Silva's strategy is... It is super aggressive, but it's not like it's super aggressive for all the money all the time. It's important to realize that aggressive does not translate to big pots. It will inevitably lead to more big pots. But imagine, would you rather play one hand per orbit with a big edge or seven hands per orbit with a small edge? You'd much rather the seven hands per orbit strategy. Should you be more aggressive early in tournaments? Um, you should be playing lots of pots early in the tournament. You met my friend Al over the weekend. He's a nice guy. He is a very nice guy. Thanks to Al Hart, he made the push fold app that we have. He made the range analyzer. He's done a lot of great work for us, and I, I definitely appreciate Al. <clears throat> Chris says you've been doing a lot of checking, and people like to bluff you. Yes, check and then check call. You're bubbling min caching a lot. What would I recommend you study? Study at PokerCoaching.com. That will teach you to not have small stacks going towards the bubble. You tighten up too much, and you're often shallow stacked. Exactly. You, Aaron, are playing the satellite structure that, or satellite strategy we've been discussing. This is why people who play satellites fail, and it's why a lot of people fail in tournaments because they get to the money bubble without a whole lot of chips. They highly prioritize getting in the money, and not necessarily even getting in the money, but not going broke. And inevitably, that leads to having shallow stacks throughout the whole end of the tournament. And sure, every once in a while, you'll get lucky and you'll win. But usually, you'll just dwindle down, lose your stack, and then be out whenever you lose one hand. And it's not good. That's not how you win at poker. You win at poker by having a big stack. And you get a big stack by being in there, being active, and getting chips. You have to be active. If people are going to be bad and straightforward, then betting a lot and using small sizes seems to work better than using a big bet strategy. Oh yeah, we're not necessarily saying use a big bet strategy. And I mean, I've played with De Silva one time recently in Montreal. I think he took third or fourth or fifth place. And he used lots and lots of small bets. I mean, he was the only person using a limping strategy. It's like the smallest bet you can make. But he was very active, right? Being active does not necessarily mean big bets. It can mean big bets. And you should be using big bets sometimes just because that's good poker. If you only use one bet size on every street, you're leaving a ton of money on the tables. I mean, this is easily provable by using a, a Game Theory Optimal Solver, right? You're going to see if you plug in five different bet sizes, the solver will pick all five of those bet sizes because you need to have a spread of bets for each type of hand. You put much into live reads when playing. Against bad players, I certainly do. If people give off obvious tells, then uh, you should certainly be using them. At high stakes games, though, they're pretty much irrelevant, or close enough to irrelevant. If someone offers you five big blinds for a seat in a cash game to trade seats, would you take it every time? Oh, absolutely not. Um, some seats are great, some seats are terrible. Also, depends on if you're going to leave, all right? If you're about to leave, if someone gives you five big blinds to take your seat, think of the value, right? Uh, but yeah, Aaron, go, go uh, sign up to the free trial at PokerCoaching.com. By the way, we made it to where you don't have to have a credit card for that anymore. So, you, or PayPal or anything, you just go sign up, you get access immediately. Um, we limited it a bit, so you can't just go through all our quizzes and then be done with me. But you can go there and you can sign up completely for free, give it a try, and you'll see how I and Matt Affleck and Alex Fitzgerald discuss building a stack so we actually have a good chance to win the tournaments. How do you say active when card dead? Oh, well, luckily for you, I have an article on this. It's called How to Thrive When Card Dead. Or is that an article or a video? Hmm, that's a video series. How to Thrive When Card Dead. Go look it up. Basically, take every potential spot they give you. You are probably not seeing all the spots that have been presented. Because, um, well, let's say they fold to the cutoff and you have queen three offsuit in the small blind. Take cutoff raises. That's a spot where you definitely can three bet. Most people don't three bet that queen three offsuit. But if you've been very card dead, that's a pretty reasonable hand to three bet. Ace X offsuit, King X offsuit, these are great to three bet, even from out of position. If you know your opponent is opening slightly wide and will fold to your three bet, obviously use a big sizing. They make it um, two and a half big blinds, you make it nine or ten. And um, then you'd be willing to play well. Greer says you're up $10,000 this year because of my material. Good job, good work. I mean, you're. You're up $10,000 because you put in the hard work to get good at the game. And I'm glad that I could help along the way. But P. 
people get good and they succeed at poker because they want to get good and succeed at poker. They are good at finding the right resources. It's a very important skill. And they put in the time to do it, right? If you don't put in the time, if you are very, like, essentially mindless with your poker content con consume consummation? What am I doing with my English? If you consume the wrong content, you'll be bad. If you waste your time studying the wrong things, you'll be bad. If you don't put time in at the tables, you'll be bad. And it sounds like Grizz is doing all the right things, so good job and congrats on that. I hope you keep it up. Assuming you want to keep it up, you know? Everyone doesn't necessarily want to keep it up. But if you want to continue grinding it up, it sounds like you are well situated to do that. Let's see, one strategy used in the last tournament you played was Alex Fitzgerald's opening less, targeting people who open a lot, and three betting light in position. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you say it worked well, good. I mean, that's, that's what you should be doing, right? You don't have to be opening a ton of hands, but it is good to be three betting a decent amount, especially against players who are too loose, especially if you also have a relatively tight image. Um, like, you just don't, you don't have to open all sorts of garbage. I mean, if you look at Game Theory Optimal Strategies, they don't open a whole lot of garbage. And um, to be fair, they don't let you do a whole lot of three betting, but if your opponents fold too much pre-flop, let's say the blinds fold too often, yes, you should be raising a lot. If players raise too often, they will fold to three bets too often, so you um, three bet a lot. So that's good. Any plans to visit Ireland? No, I have a baby. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Also, I have an article about travel rake, and essentially I travel primarily to play very high stakes tournaments, and that's it, because it doesn't make sense financially to travel to smaller tournaments at this point for me. Does my course teach, teach cash games or tournaments? Both. I think a lot of people think tournaments are drastically different than um, cash games, and they're really not until you get to the middle and later stages. The early levels of tournaments are pretty much exactly like cash games, except for you need to be a little bit tighter when it comes to value betting and calling off, because if you lose, you don't get to re-enter, but that's really the only difference. Um, tournaments are actually becoming more different than cash games. I will make that statement because now, thanks to the big blind ante, which is popular in pretty much all tournaments now, um, they're putting antes in earlier in the tournament, which means you are essentially playing with an ante throughout the entire tournament now. And uh, poker with an ante is very different than poker without an ante because there's just significantly more money in the pot. So keep that in mind. You can't wait to quit your job and play for a living. Well, keep studying, grind up a bankroll, take it slow, don't be in a rush. If you wanna make poker a sustainable thing for you long-term, don't be in a rush. Take your time, learn to get good, be very cautious when it comes to taking big risks for lots of your money. Um, it's the exact opposite of what a lot of people do. They want to uh, get rich quick by winning a tournament and then becoming a poker pro. And that is not such a good idea unless you get uh, super, super rich. I'm currently working with um, Scarmaker, who took third place in the um, party poker tournament recently for $1.3 million. It's a pretty good third place for $1.3 million. Um, he bought, got in for $5 through a satellite, won his way into the 5K, took third place in that. He um, credited my teachings for that, so I figured I'd contact him, and we're working together now to get him ready for the World Series of Poker. In that scenario, if you go from having a $5,000 bankroll like he had to a $1.3 million bankroll overnight, well, then, you know, you're pretty much set for life if you are not a fish. And it turns out he's not a fish. He's actually smart. He's investing a ton of it. He's going to give himself a relatively small poker bankroll. He's going to try to grind it up. He's going to go to Vegas, play some 1500s and whatnot, but certainly not give away his money. And I'm going to make sure of that because um, I've made plenty of mistakes. Lots of people have made plenty of mistakes. And I want to make sure he does not. Very rarely are you just blessed with uh, 1.3 million dollars and i'm excited to help him continue progressing and if he does decide poker is not for him then i want to make sure that he is very well set up for life so that he can enjoy it and do whatever he wants to do uh, it's very different than what a lot of people do they go to the club and they blast all of it off in two years and they play a few hundred k's and next thing you know they're broke so if you ever come into money don't do that i actually made a video with mike sexton you can find it on YouTube. Um, what's it called? Watch this once you've won a million dollars. Go watch that once you've won a million dollars or after this is over. And uh, we'll discuss a lot about mistakes you can make and a few tips to avoid them. The thing is, is that if people are gonna make these mistakes, 
even if you tell them to avoid it, they're still just going to do it. People have leaks. People have flaws. And you have to be very disciplined, right? It's hard to be disciplined all the time pertaining to everything. So <laughs> Mike discussed this concept of, you know, it's okay to have one leak, but if you have more than one leak, you're pretty much doomed. And find a leak to have that is not so detrimental or maybe even good for you. Like for example, maybe your leak can be you work out too much at the gym. You neglect everything in life, but you have a fantastic physique and you're in great shape. Not such a bad leak, right? Maybe your leak is you watch um, three hours of movies every day. Not such a bad leak. Uh, bad leaks are drugs. Alcohol is a drug. Drugs, alcohol, um, gambling. Complete laziness, right? If you do nothing for a long period of time. Amon actually asked, what, is, what are some tips to overcome laziness? That's a hard one, right? You have to realize that if you do nothing, you get nothing done with your life. Your time is limited. Time is the only resource you have that is very, very limited that you cannot get back. So don't squander it, right? That said, a little bit of laziness is um, good and advisable. You can't work hard all the time. I, I run into that where I work too hard. Let me see if I have a book over here. Let's see. Uh, here it is. Personal Organization for Degenerates by my friend Brandon Adams. It's a good book. It discusses going through periods of like hardcore working and then also periods of hardcore laziness. And this book taught me, I am a bit of a workaholic, to um, whenever you are in that period of laziness, don't necessarily force things unless you have to. Um, and I don't have to do anything at this point. So enjoy your life. When you're ready to work hard, work hard. And if you are like me, if you are a true degenerate, you will be ready to work again very, very soon. And if that means taking two or three days off to goof off, sure. But at the same time, if you are just completely lazy all the time to get nothing done, or if you have a horrible procrastination issue, then I don't know. I know Elliot Rowe, he wrote for Excelling at No Limit Holden back there. He, um, he, he, that's one of the main things he helps online players with is putting in volume. Because a lot of online players don't want to put in a significant amount of volume. This is a small book, by the way. Don't buy it and think you're going to get a 500-page book. It's very short. 30 pages or so. 37 pages. But I liked it. And, um, you know, information like this is worth every penny if you actually want to apply it. Imagine you read something for, I don't know how much this costs. Let's say it costs $20, which I'm sure it's less than that. If this costs $20. And it changes your life because you go from being a workaholic all the time to now you will take an off day, especially when you feel like it. Like, what is that worth? That's worth infinite money. So anyway, I'm glad Brandon Adams wrote that because I learned a lot from it. He is uh, what I want to be when I grow up. People tell me they want to be like me when I grow up. I want to be like Brandon Adams when I grow up. Have I tried Holden Manager 3? Heads up display. Well, I don't even know. I use uh, Holden Manager 2, I think. And I don't know. I, I'm not so strict and stringent on HUDs, right? Peter said, good morning from Stockholm. PCSPC stream the Bahamas had people opening very wide. Is this normal? Um, probably people were playing way too tightly because um, everyone got in for free, <laughs> right? And a lot of people were, were probably gonna make a lot of mistakes. So you should be significantly more aggressive and playing more pots if people are going to be making errors. All right, here we have one hand history question, or one for the day. 54 big blinds, seven handed, one limp, you're on the cutoff, you make it 4.5 big blinds, flop comes queen seven, I'm sorry, jack seven four, both check, turn queen, he bets, should you shove your queen? Well, we don't know what you have besides a queen. Um, no, you should call the queen. Definitely do not shove when there are three to a flush on the board because you're going to get called by better hands. Protection is overrated. One of your guys won 21K and tipped $80. Is this average or normal, et cetera, et cetera? Um, in most tournaments, they take out money for the tip already, so you should not feel any obligation to tip unless you feel like it. How's the family? The family's great. Everyone's good. Um, wife's good. Two babies are good. They're all good. Mastering small stakes and hold them is great. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed that book. It cost you 40 bucks, but you want it back already. That's, that's what happens with educational content. 
Um, Nickel says 320 platinum passes, 1,000 entries. So 820 people got uh, bought in for 25K, but that's not exactly accurate because um, I know the website did a lot of satelliting people in. Also, I know a lot of pros, pros, who are marginal pros who normally play like $1,000 average buy-in sold action and they got in. So there were a lot of players who went there specifically to play that one tournament. So of that 1,000 players, probably 250 of them had the majority of their action that they bought in themselves. And then 750 of them, give or take, probably did not. And that leads to people playing very snugly or just not being the normal caliber of a 25K buy-in player. All right, let's see. In the tournament, you did not feel obligated to tip because they took $10 for the dealer add-on. Listen, I mean, tipping is certainly a personal thing. You should never feel obligated to do anything in life. That said, um, if they do take tip already, and if there's a $10 dealer add-on, well, that's the dealer tip right there. And they still probably take a little bit out of the prize pool for the management or whatever they want to call them. So... Um, in those scenarios, you really should not feel obligated to tip. I agree with Natty. Some dumb questions are very good. They're very enlightening and very educational. But yes, if you have a 10 big blind stack and someone raises, you're either all in or you're folding. How do you play a short stack? By the book. <laughs> by the book. Learn to play by the book. Uh, I actually have an app, the Float the Turn Push Fold app. You can find it, Float the Turn Poker, in the app stores. It's not optimal for short stacks because you should have a min raising range and a shoving range, not just a shoving range. But playing by that will be way better than what most people do. And William says, if they did not take money out of the prize, well, it would be very bad not to tip. I mean, I have a different mindset on this. I think um, people who run a game, people who own a restaurant, et cetera, et cetera, should pay their workers a fair wage. And they should not rely on people to do something, especially if it's not very clearly stated. Um, that said, we do live in a society where I think everyone knows to tip, right? I mean, if you go to a, a lot of countries now, they do not tip. A lot of countries do not let you tip at the poker table. It is illegal. Why? Because it should be obvious, right? You're giving money to the guy who's giving you the cards. Seems as shady as it can be, right? Um, it's not shady, but it seems shady. Could easily be misconstrued as shady. So I think, personally, you should not be allowed to tip. I think you should have to pay a higher rake. And I think, um, like at restaurants, they should just make the food more expensive. Make the food 15% more expensive. Call it a day. No tipping. You know? That said, tips do lead to better service. Usually. Um, that said, again, if you go to a restaurant and the service is marginal, maybe you tip 15%. If you go and the service is amazing, maybe you tip 20%. Is that amazing service worth only 5% more? I mean, if it was up to me, I would either tip 100% or 0% or some, somewhere in between that spread with the average being 15%, which means a lot of people are going to be getting 8%. And of course, uh, we don't do that. We just tip everyone too, way too much. It's a huge cultural thing. It definitely does. Depends on how much the minimum wage is in the current in that country. In America, actually, uh, minimum wage is like I don't know, ten or twelve bucks an hour. But for some reason, they can pay waiters and waitresses like three dollars an hour. I don't know why that is. It doesn't make any sense to me. But unfortunately, that is how it is. Tipping is corporate America's way of not paying their employees properly and passing that burden to the customers. Yeah, yeah, I I generally agree with that. In your car room, dealers need tips to survive. Well, then maybe they should not be dealers. At the end of the day, if your boss does not pay you to do the job that you are doing, that's a problem. Everyone should be paid a fair wage in my mind. And if they're not, well, sometimes you got to go find a different job. And if you are willing to work purely to hope that people tip you, realize sometimes, I guess you're going to go hungry. It sounds awful, but... Um, it's rough. The tip is built in, service is awful everywhere. It's a tough thing, right? You say it's awful everywhere though. A lot of Japanese restaurants in New York City, you can't tip and the service is impeccable. All right, I'm gonna go for today. 
I have 27 seconds to wrap it up according to Instagram. We're all over the place today. Let's try to stay on point tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed this. If you enjoyed tournament structures and you think your friends do too, share it with them. Good luck. Have fun. Be nice to someone. We will be back. Not tomorrow. I misspoke. We will be back on Wednesday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Have fun. Good luck. I love you all. Bye-bye.